Next speaker is uh, Christopher Garibo, who is Associate Professor of Orthopedics and Anesthesiology, Director of Chronic Pain Management Hospital for Joint Diseases, New York University. And he's going to give us a talk on um, acute to chronic pain pathophysiology. But I'd like to compliment uh, Dr. Klaus' talk um, in my presentation in that as an anesthesiologist, I do see a lot of acute to chronic pain progression, and I do think there is the concept of fibromyalgianus, but I also do think that certain surgical models are just associated with a higher incidence of uh, chronic pain, such as, for example, somebody getting a thoracotomy, somebody getting some type of spine surgery that simply produces chronic pain at a higher incidence. And just like how we're getting a better understanding of the changes that occur in the brain, with fibromyalgia, I think we can also get a better understanding of what happens in the peripheral nervous system uh, in those patients that develop acute to chronic pain progression. So, so therefore, certain surgical models are clearly um, have a higher incidence of such development. I guess the question becomes also, what can we do from a design policy and procedure standpoint to mitigate some of this acute to chronic pain progression? So that's where some of my interest is, and that's where some of my practical experiences in terms of developing policy and procedure to provide good initial mobilization of the patient after an injury to mitigate some of the musculoskeletal changes and neuropathic changes that occur after trauma or, or surgery. I think another way to think of learning more about acute to chronic pain progression and about the pathophysiology uh, that occurs from a, from a biochemical and from a neuroanatomical standpoint is to also learn this for the purpose of just getting reimbursed better and also better, take better care of our patients. Uh, pain management is something that's measured across the board now. It's reflected in our HCAP scores. 20% of our payments are withheld because of, for let's say, patient dissatisfaction due to pain management services. So I'll also be presenting to you some policy and procedure that you can consider implementing uh, in your practices to improve uh, patient satisfaction. Now, the, the probability of having chronic pain uh, is simply higher af after certain types of surgery, as I stated earlier, and the examples of that are, for example, any type of limb amputation is associated with um, some, whether if it's stump pain or phantom pain subsequently of anywhere from 30 to 83 percent or so. Now, ultimately, that may telescope and disappear, and ultimately, it may be much less than how it was initially, but nevertheless, it is something that we see quite pre prevalently, especially in the first 12 months after surgery. The same thing holds for thoracotomy as well. Just about every single single thoracotomy patient that I see, I, would, I call it sort of subacute with my fellows, but then it's not subacute anymore. It sort of becomes subchronic and then chronic, and about 10-15% of patients, the post-thoracotomy pain doesn't go away at all. And these patients didn't start off with the fibromyalgia type presentation. They had low pain sensitivity to begin with, but something neurological occurred, something musculoskeletal occurred at the time of the surgery such that they had persistent pain. Mastectomies, cholecystectomies, hernia surgery, back surgery, and so on are all pain models that we're familiar with that are predisposed to chronic pain development. So in an effort to understand that, I guess from more from a therapeutic perspective, I think that the definitional understanding and the class-specific understanding that divides pain into two separate subtypes is sort of pretty primitive. But it's sort of a clinical tool that we use um, as we sort out where the pain may be coming from. Is it central? Is it peripheral? What percent is peripheral? What percent is central? Is something that we sort out, especially in the subacute and the, and the subchronic phases, but also in the pharmacological plan, it's helpful to know how much of a nociceptive presentation is there and how much of a neuropathic presentation is there. But that's really limited. Uh, I think we need to have a better resolution of what, what, what's happening. Uh, and I think we need to have a better resolution of what's, on, on what's happening in the peripheral nervous system as well. So here's somebody getting considerable acute pain, and some of this is clearly circumstantial, and there's no question there's going to be significant activation of the first order neuron with this, but I think we need to have an understanding of where the pain is coming from during acute injury if you're going to determine how that's ultimately going to progress to, from acute to chronic. So there's first order neuron activation. Um, where there is peripheral sensitization that occurs, there is secondary sensitization and secondary hyperalgesia that occurs. Ultimately, that gets communicated to the second order neurons where there could be upregulation or downregulation of the pain. And that's where the Wall and Malzac theory of, of, of gate control theory of pain resides, in that the ascending fibers are intersending. In, uh, or interfacing with the descending fibers. And then the second order neurons communicate with the third order neurons that ultimately come, interact with the brain. And ultimately, there are descending fibers as well. So think of 